Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman says Israelis are entitled to live peacefully on their own land. He made his comments in an interview with the US magazine The Atlantic. Previously, Saudi Arabia has refused to acknowledge any ancestral Jewish rights. He qualified his comments by stating that a peace agreement would have to be in place with Palestinians first. His views are being seen as another public sign of closer ties with Israel, but some also see it as a swipe at Iran, a country with which Saudi Arabia is in dispute on several fronts, including war-torn Yemen. Increased tension between Tehran and Riyadh has fueled speculation that shared interests may push Saudi Arabia and Israel to work together against what they see as a common Iranian threat. For getting reliable, knowledgeable major news articles about Saudi Arabia, Middle East and around the world, subscribe our channel Star 2 Sun and don't forget to click on bell. It's free. Why the Saudi Crown Prince's first official meeting with Jewish leaders is such a big deal. Saudi Arabia has no public churches, temples or synagogues and important crosses and other non-Islamic religious imagery, including the Star of David, is banned. Saudi Arabia officially announced Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's first meetings with Jewish religious leaders. 
On Wednesday, Prince Mohammed, often referred to as MBS, met with Rabbi Richard Jacobs, President of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Stephen Wernick, Head of the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism and Alan Fagan, Executive Vice President of the Orthodox Union, the Saudi Embassy said according to Bloomberg. The meeting emphasized the common bond among all people, particularly people of faith, which stresses the importance of tolerance, coexistence, and working together for a better future for all of humanity, the embassy said. MBS was reportedly set to meet U.S. Jewish leaders on Tuesday with various Jewish groups represented at the meeting. The Wednesday meeting is not the first time a Saudi leader has officially met with a rabbi as the late King Abdullah met New York-based Rabbi Mark Shanier on multiple occasions. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said last Sunday that last week's inauguration of Air India direct flights to Israel over Saudi Arabia creates huge potential for Israel with significant and long-term implications. The significance is clear to everyone, the Prime Minister said at his weekly cabinet meeting on Sunday, adding that the implications, which he called of the first degree, have economic and diplomatic implications as well and impact relating to tourism and technology. Public observance in Saudi Arabia of religions other than Islam is illegal, forcing Christian worshippers to risk arrest by praying in their homes. The country has no public churches, temples or synagogues and importing crosses and other non-Islamic religious imagery, including the Star of David, is banned. However, MBS's reforms have led to a loosening of restrictions which included Christmas trees being publicly displayed in the capital, Riyadh, for the first time last year. MBS has been promoting religion's tolerance and a more moderate Islam as part of his Vision 2030 reform project. In early March, MBS met the head of the Anglican Church in London and promised to promote interfaith dialogue as part of his domestic reforms, the British Faith Leaders Office said. MBS was making an official visit to London to promote Saudi Arabia as a tolerant, modernizing economy and build a wider trade and investment relationship with Britain a long-term defense ally. The Archbishop shared his concern about limits placed on Christian worship in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and highlighted the importance for leaders of all faiths to support freedom of religion or belief, drawing on the experience of the UK. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash in England. Jacob, this is This Week in Prophecy. And what a week it is and is proving to be one of the most important this week some prophecy we've ever had. Prince Mohammed bin Salman, crown prince and future king of Saudi Arabia, is in the midst of his three-week tour to the United States. Among other things, he's concluded a $2.3 billion arms deal, another one, on top of the massive one he already negotiated with Mr. Trump. This time will involve artillery, particularly the Paladin howitzer system, and accessory apparatus. Saudi Arabia is bogged down in Yemen, facing threats to the north, and everything is in the shadow of Iran. Massive changes are propelling him to go in a direction that would have been unthinkable not long ago. We've been speaking about his crackdown on the fundamentalists in the House of Saud and the Salafist clergy, the proponents of radical Wahhabism. This includes his sequestering of Prince Atawid ben Saud, who has been the director of the Kingdom Fund and a major, major funder of Wahhabist causes, institutions, programs, and universities in the West for many years. And now a major change is coming. Keep praying for the changes we need to see in Saudi Arabia. It would have been unthinkable that God could have cracked the House of Saud and the Wahhabist clergy as he did, but he's cracking them. This week in prophecy, something extraordinary happened. Some are attributing it as a diplomatic success to Jared, Jared Kushner. Others simply attribute it to the desperation that Saudi Arabia is facing in light of the Iranian threat to their existence in the Sunni-Shia conflict.
however one wishes to interpret it, the prince made a statement in the United States this week in prophecy, saying that the Jews are entitled to their land of Israel. They have the same rights as the Palestinian Arabs to a land. This would have been unthinkable, but the Lord can do anything. I recall walking through Moscow and St. Petersburg in Russia, formerly Leningrad, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Statues of Lenin with the heads chopped off. Uh, everything just falling to pieces. Mr. Putin, driven by Russian nationalism, has tried to revive Russia, and he's doing it along militaristic lines, but he's not really doing anything to salvage the economy. Russia remains Russia. You go 10, 12, 15 miles outside of Moscow, you're almost in the third world. Be that as it may, having grown up at that time of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam War, it would have been unthinkable that the Lord would bring down the Soviet Union. But he did. They persecuted the church. They cursed Israel and the Jews. God raised his hand. The house of Saud had done the same thing. Rather than be cursed, the current crown prince is looking to make peace with Israel. But it has played out in a particularly unique way this week. This week in prophecy, the Trump administration announced its plans to withdraw from Syria after the defeat of ISIS. Both Israel, Mr. Netanyahu, and Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia, both of them publicly warned about leaving a vacuum in Syria, equating it correctly with the vacuum that was left by Barack Obama in Iraq, a vacuum that was filled by ISIS. Mr. Trump was challenged, almost confronted by both Mr. Netanyahu and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia simultaneously, saying, do not repeat the mistakes of Barack Obama. Do not leave a vacuum around, we'll fill it. The Trump administration has stated it will stay there until ISIS is defeated, but has agreed to leave a residual American advisory force of 2,000 in Syria, in addition to the nearby forces that are in Iraq and that can be mustered. Mr. Trump is a businessman. He negotiates. It could have been his negotiating ploy to try to press the Saudi Arabians, the Jordanians, and the other centrist Muslim nations to step up and fill the gap themselves with American backing. It worked. Mr. Trump persuaded the Crown Prince to put up another $4 billion to sustain security presence in Syria and in rebuilding areas of Syria that are under American and Kurdish control in the face of the Russian presence in league with Iran and Mr. Assad's regime. It is peculiar to see somebody who runs government as a businessman as opposed to running it as a politician. But it seems to succeed. Now this, of course, is God's hand. It's the prayer of the saints. These changes that we've seen in the house of Saud, this recognition of Israel's right to exist by the Saudi government, this willingness of the Saudis, despite their own conflicts in Yemen, to step up financially and assume some of the responsibility for the costs in maintaining a security presence in Syria are major, major changes. Continue to pray for President Trump. It has happened this week in prophecy.
the government of Saudi Arabia has, in effect, recognized Israel's right to exist. Diplomatic relations may not be far off in the sense of them being formally established, but they're already established in terms of secret diplomatic and intelligence cooperation. Quite a thing to see the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and the Prime Minister of Israel both contacting Mr. Trump, asking him not to leave a gap in Syria the way Barack Obama did in Iraq. And it happened this week in prophecy. Last week in prophecy, we explained the Israeli incursion by American manufactured F-35 aircraft into Iran. And we said they would either need refueling in bases possibly in Saudi Arabia or at least aerial refueling over Saudi Arabia unless they went the other direction. That is, they flew over Syria and Iraq. In that case, there would not be a need for refueling. The range capacity of the F-35 was adequate for the Israelis to reach Iran and return without the need to refuel by taking the route they took over Iraq. Now, this would have required some degree of cooperation with the Iraqi government undoubtedly responding to American pressure. It shows the United States was involved in what transpired last week in prophecy, but this week in prophecy, we have better data concerning it. This week in prophecy, what was supposed to be the march of a million men or a million people turned out to be perhaps 30,000. But more were coming. Literally, on Friday after prayers, buses were sent to mosques and people were ushered onto the buses to come to the protests at the Gaza-Israeli border. Again, as we reported, 10 of the 16 who were shot by the Israelis were known Hamas terrorists or those involved with Islamic radicalism aligned to Hamas. This did not, of course, matter to the United Nations, who were demanding this week in prophecy that Israel stop responding as forcibly as they have and not use firearms unless it is absolutely necessary. Well... Who defines when it's absolutely necessary? The United Nations or the people who are under threat? Things have fizzled now. Far fewer people are coming. But what has happened at the Gaza border is massive tire burnings, perhaps 10,000. This puts a toxin into the atmosphere that a lot of those people were forced to breathe. Burning rubber is not a good thing. There are so many chemicals that go into the manufacture of tires, causing black clouds of smoke around these tens of thousands of people at the border who are inhaling it. And again, they are brought there on buses by Hamas. Well, they have to breathe, and, ha and Hamas forces them to be there. And Hamas tells them to set the tires alight. Now, what good that's supposed to do, nobody seems to know except them. It's just like they want to do something. But it's fizzling. It has not worked. Israel had meetings with the chief of Egyptian intelligence this week. And there has been progress, both in Egypt's dealings with the Hamas government in Gaza, but a significant military victory against the forces of ISIS who have been active in the Sinai. The Sinai has a common border with Israel. 
going from Eilat up to the Gaza Strip. You can drive along it. Israel would be very vulnerable to attacks from the Sinai. Moderate Muslims, like Mahdi's, 300 of them in a mosque, were murdered by radical Muslims. And you have ISIS activity taking place. This week in prophecy, Egypt finally struck a decisive victory against the ISIS presence. This is to the benefit of both Mr. Sisi's government in Egypt, but also to the Israelis. It came at the area of the Halal Caves, which was a command center for ISIS. It's frightening that ISIS, having been obliterated in Iraq and in Syria, went looking for new homes and found one so close to Israel in the Sinai, uh, making cities like Beersheba and Eilat particularly vulnerable to ISIS terrorist attacks. But coordinated with Egypt, ISIS is now being reduced effectively in the Sinai. So we see Egypt on the west and Saudi Arabia on the south and on the east actively collaborating with Israel against radical Muslims. Iran, Hamas, ISIS, this week in prophecy. Let us continue. Major, major developments began taking place this week in Syria. We have been speaking recently about the Turkish incursions into the Kurdish areas of Afrin in northern Syria. Two weeks ago, the United States closed its base, its air base in Incirlik, or at least withdrew the American presence from it. This has seen, predictably, Mr. Erdogan, Rashid Erdogan, an Islamist, tip towards Putin and Russia. Meeting with the Russians, he agreed to the purchase of the S-400 missile system. Now, how effective the S-400 is going to be remains a question. The Russians try to sell a product with a lot of hype. But somehow the Israelis and the Americans always seem to have a way of outsmarting them. German pilots flying other planes in mock aerial exercises against American pilots with the F-35 have stated we couldn't get near the F-35. We could not get within 20 miles of it. The Americans saw us before we saw them. They could lock on. That's how good the stealth was on the F-35. This is a very complicated issue, but in short, yes, they can. There are some major misconceptions regarding stealth, mainly the myth that the stealth plane is invisible. A more accurate description is that stealth makes the aircraft smaller. When radar waves hit an object, they will reflect back in different directions, depending on the object's shape. Since aircrafts have very complicated shapes, with the wings, cockpit, vertical stabilizers, bombs, etc., it is almost guaranteed that some of the radar waves will be reflected back to the radar station. Stealth is a whole field of study dedicated to reducing the amount of radar waves that are reflected back to the radar receiver. This is accomplished in two main ways. First, the shaping of the aircraft to deflect the radar waves away, and the second is coating the aircraft with material that can absorb the radar waves. The amount of radar waves an object reflects back to the receiver is measured by what is called its radar cross-section, or RCS. A typical fourth generation fighter has an RCS of approximately 5 to 10 square meters, whereas a stealth aircraft will have an RCS thousands of times smaller. Radar detection range is in proportion to the fourth root 
of its RCS. So, for example, if a radar can detect a 10 square meter object from 100 miles away, then an object with an RCS of 1 square meter would not be detected until it is 56 miles away. And with a stealth fighter like the F-35, with an estimated RCS 2,000 times smaller, it wouldn't be able to be detected by that radar until it was within 15 miles. Now these detection ranges vary drastically depending on the frequency of the radar being used. Lower frequencies have longer waves, some measuring several feet long. Longer waves are much more likely to detect these stealth aircraft. This is because to absorb radar waves and not to reflect them, the thickness of the coating is proportional to the length of the waves. So a lower frequency radar with a wave that is several feet long would require the aircraft to have several foot thick coating completely surrounding it to absorb the radar. Obviously, this is not realistic for a fighter jet. This is the way which the Russians and Chinese can detect the American stealth aircraft with lower frequency radars. And these types of radars were the kind used to shoot down the stealth F-117 in Yugoslavia back in 1999. The surface-to-air missile site used a Russian lower frequency P-18 radar to detect and track the stealth jet. The P-18 radar uses a frequency with waves approximately 10 feet long, which is way too long to be absorbed by the F-117 stealth coating. However, there are several problems with lower frequency radars. One is that creating such a long, low frequency wave requires very large antennas. The size of the antenna, again, is directly proportional to the frequency it can create. Such large radars are too big to be carried by aircraft, so they need to be stationed on the ground and large radars are typically less mobile, meaning that their locations can be known and simply avoided by the stealth aircraft. Another issue is that they are much less precise than higher frequency radars. Because of the long waves, it is much harder to pinpoint the exact location of the aircraft, and is typically not precise enough to guide an interceptor missile to shoot down the aircraft. The F-117 shootdown was an exception to this, mainly because it was within only a few miles of the radar, and as stated earlier, stealth does not make an aircraft invisible, just not able to be detected until it is much closer. And finally, passive radar could be used, theoretically, to detect stealth aircraft. Basically, passive radar is similar to active radar, except it does not send out its own radio waves. It relies on other transmissions, like AM or FM radio, television, or even GPS signals. The radar receiver can detect these transmissions and also the reflection of these transmissions off the aircraft and then calculate its location based on the time difference. This technique is beneficial, mainly because these stealth aircraft are designed to be stealthy against the most commonly used military radar frequencies, so using a variety of different frequencies from different sources can better detect the aircraft. This technique, however, is very complicated and typically requires more receivers to triangulate the aircraft's location. It also requires extremely sensitive receivers, as the transmissions and signals are typically much weaker than active radar. Both Israel and America have enhanced the avionics package, which we saw last week, with the overflights by the Israelis using F-35s into Iran, which the United States helped facilitate. What the Russian military philosophy has always been, even in the Cold War, is to put quantity above quality, while the Americans put quality above quantity. But now Mr. Putin has another problem. He does not have the economic engines to produce large numbers of Russian stealth fighters that anyway would not be highly competitive against the American F-35 and possibly F-22. The biggest contract was with India, but now India is calling Russia into default on those contracts because they cannot get enough replacement components that have not been manufactured in significant enough quantities. Mr. Putin, just like his predecessors in the Kremlin during the Cold War, does not understand you need a good economic base to have a good and advanced defense base. Unlike the United States and unlike China, 
This is not true of Russia. They are there, they are making trouble, but they are desperate. Desperate people do desperate things. Do not just watch Russia's alignment with the Assad regime in Syria. Watch his increasing alignment, as we've been saying, with Turkey. Again, most people are yelling Gog and Magog all the time. That is something we take into consideration as a possibility. But we should avoid sensationalism, and we should avoid uh, making unqualified statements that cannot be demonstrated as if there's a countdown to what actually happening. We've seen people do these things, and then when the things they predict don't happen, they move on and predict something else that doesn't happen. We don't want to do that, but we do want to be watchful. As Jesus said, be alert. Be watchful for these things. A rapprochement between Russia and a NATO member, Turkey, is very interesting. Turkey is now acquiring its weapons from Russia, even though NATO was established to help Turkey withstand Russia. This has reached a new climax this week in prophecy. And it's not only the United States. Following the Turkish incursion into largely Kurdish-held territory in the Alpine region of northern Syria, after closing the American presence at the base of Insulik, the Trump administration, in collaboration with the French and in secret collaboration on certain levels with the Israelis and other Arab countries, but particularly and conspicuously the French, had begun to position Franco-American forces in league with the Kurds in opposition and in juxtaposition to Turkish ambitions to control that property in northern Syria inhabited by Kurds. Their fear is that the Kurds are supportive of the YPK, the independence movement for the Kurdish people inside of Turkey. This is his fear. This is his consistent agenda. But now, French special forces have moved into two American bases at Man Beach and Ramelin, boosting the NATO presence against what is supposed to be another NATO country, namely Turkey. Turkey is not behaving like a partner in the NATO alliance. The French units arrived in Manjib on Monday, the same day that the Turkish president, Rakib Erdogan, visited his troops with congratulations on their capture of al Frin from the U.S.-backed Kurdish YPG militia forces or those aligned with it. Clan and army fatigues of a Turkish general, Erdogan signaled in his speech, the Kurds would be basically decimated if necessary. And he would move swiftly to beat, to beat them. This time, however, something happened. President Trump moved swiftly to beat the Kurdish leader. The Americans also arranged for the Iraq to send its fifth division of its army to the Sinjar province and lined his troops up on the Iraqi-Syrian border, obstructing any further Turkish advances into the area of Syria and Iraq that they're interested in. Erdogan was unable to make good on his threat. He could not seize any more territory unless the Kurdish PKK withdrew from the bases there. So what you see now is actively the Americans and the French backing the Kurds against Turkey. Turkey moving closer to Russia. Watch this space. It is happening this week in prophecy. This is a crisis within NATO that's not even being reported. France and America withstanding another NATO partner. Deploying troops to prevent the further advance of another NATO country, specifically Turkey. Quite a situation. 
and it's happening this week in prophecy. Turkey can really no longer be considered an ally or even a NATO member functionally. It's all political and diplomatic window dressing now. They are closer to the Russian camp and obviously they are closer to Iran in certain aspects. Now, this becomes even more complicated because Mr. Putin and Russia are backing Assad, but Turkey dislikes Assad. So, on one hand, he wants to cooperate with Putin because he's not getting what he wants from the Americans. On the other hand, he's alienated his NATO partners by leaning towards Putin. He's stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place. He's not going to be able to continue his campaign of aggression. With the kind of impunity he's done so far in Syria. But understand something. This risks, it risks the possibility of direct military conflict between the United States and France and Turkey. It risks that. Obviously, it's a risk he does not want to take, and he's been pulling away, not expecting the Americans or the French to do what they did. Remember, France was the colonial power in Syria. Syria was a country created by France after the First World War. France has always seen itself as having an interest in Syria and in Lebanon. But it's happening this week in prophecy. The reaction by Erdogan to France was to accuse him of fraud <clears throat> and saying that it was a French military invasion of Syria, when in fact it was simply an alliance with the Trump administration to frustrate Erdogan's expansionism into Syria and Iraq in his campaign against Kurds and Kurdish nationalism. It's happening this week in prophecy. It is significant and it is major. This week in prophecy, something even more pressing and more major. The United Nations demilitarized region between the Israeli border on the Golan Heights and Syria, which basically constitutes the southern and the southwestern suburbs of Damascus, is demilitarized since the 1970s in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. It was manned by UN peacekeepers, about a thousand of them from countries such as Ireland, that have since left and come into Israel to avoid being dragged into the conflict within Syria. This week in prophecy, Syria moved its 5th, 7th, and 9th divisions, plus its 4th armored division, into this region on the Israeli border attempting to do there what they've done at East Galta. We know from what happened at East Galta, we know that Assad cannot operate without Russian support and Russian air support. These Russian-backed and advised forces are right now on the Israeli border in an area that was supposed to be demilitarized in the agreements engineered and negotiated by Henry Kissinger in 1973. You can see Kunitra. You can see Kunitra from inside the Israeli border. I've seen it many times. You can see it with the naked eye. You can see automobiles driving it. With binoculars, you can see people walking in it. Now with the UN troops gone, the Irish troops gone, who's there? 
Russian-backed Syrian forces at Ra'a and Kunitra. I don't know how to explain this. Kunitra is like Tijuana is to San Diego. You can stand on one side of the fence and see it. But it's happening this week in prophecy. Let's press on. Israel attempted to deport tens of thousands of African immigrants who entered Israel illegally. They have attempted deportations to African countries or to have them leave to other countries that may wish to accept them. This has led to a legal and political fight within Israel and certain international pressures. Why these people would come all the way to Israel is beyond anyone's guess except that Israel has the highest standard of living in the region and the Egyptians and Saudi Arabians and other countries don't want them. The Islamic countries turn them down. Nobody wants them. The Egyptians have even shot live ammunition and killed some of them. They make it to the Sinai to Israel, and now 37,000 of them are in limbo. They may be bound for Uganda. We have said it is our position. When black Jews, the Falashas of Ethiopia, were refugees, it was right that Israel took the black African Jews into Israel. Jews should go to Israel if they are refugees. They won't be refugees. They have a country of their own. Arab refugees going from Syria, and their numbers may increase shortly by another quarter of a million, should not be coming to Europe. They're being funneled to Europe by the hand of Recep Erdogan in large part, the Turk. No, they should be going to Islamic countries where they have a common language, culture, and religion. Christian refugees should go to Christian countries in Africa who will take them in as Christians. Only in desperate cases where you have people with nowhere to go, like Middle Eastern Christians and certain Christians from the Horn of Africa, should they be taken into Western countries. Why do these people want to come to Europe, the United States, and Israel, a small country not adequately equipped to absorb these refugees. Israel is there to take Jews. Why? Well, as it stands, you have the liberal do-gooders protesting this, mm -hmm. not living in the economic reality of who's going to give these people jobs, how are we going to support these people? They're not part of our culture. Or, or religion, what do we do with them? They're not like the Falashas who are Jews. Their numbers are 37,000. 37,000. This situation has to be rectified, has to be resolved this week in prophecy. Finally, this week in prophecy, the Temple Mount Finally, this week in prophecy, the Temple Mount wave offering was actually ceremonially harvested at Passover. This biblical harvest, when we get the hymn bringing in the sheaves, climaxes at Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks known as Pentecost to Christians, when the Book of Ruth is ceremonially read in the synagogues to this day, as it was read in the ancient temple, the Megillat Ruth. The Megillat Ruth, as we pointed out, is Matthew chapter 0. The genealogy of Jesus, as recorded in Matthew, begins in the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth, the beginning of the house of David, the genealogy of the Messiah. This commences with the paschal harvesting of the barley. The barley is used 
to make a the barley grain is used to make a certain kind of batter for the baking of bread for the Kohanim, for the priests. This barley was brought into the traditional site of King David's tomb once again, Rabbi Berg, Yosef Berg, on the present Mount Zion. Now, the present Mount Zion is not the biblical Mount Zion. It's another mountain to the west of it, still, however, within the old city of Jerusalem, close by. The fact that it took place, and it took place in a ritually orchestrated manner, is interesting in itself. But it was initiated and conducted by the Sanhedrin. By the Sanhedrin. And also by the organization of religious Jews dedicated to rebuilding the temple. They said they did it in preparation for the third temple wave of them. These people are quite serious, and it's happening, and it's happening this week in prophecy. Somehow, possibly the Antichrist is going to broker a false peace in the Middle East. It'll allow the temple to be rebuilt in exchange for concessions to Palestinian Arabs, who will have the outer court, as it says in the book of Revelation, for 42 months. In this, the false prophet will set up the image of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13, we go back to Daniel chapter 9 and Matthew 24. These people are again quite serious. So last week in prophecy, we had Paschal sacrifices in the shadow of the Mosque of Aqsa, right next to the Temple Mount. Now we have the ritual harvesting of the barley for the wave offering. And it happened this week in prophecy. And it happened under the direction of the Sanhedrin. Well, let's summarize these things once again. The main points. Prince Mohammed bin Salman completing his tour of the United States, conducting new arms deals, together with Benjamin Netanyahu, have pressed the Trump administration not to leave a gap in Syria, but to keep a residual amount of American troops. The Trump administration has agreed for the time being to keep 2,000 in exchange for the Saudi Arabians putting up $4 billion U.S. dollars. The turnouts have decreased at the border protests in Gaza, but there were enough killings for which the UN, as always, routinely blamed Israel, even though most of those who were killed were known to be Hamas militants. This week in prophecy, Syria has entered the demilitarized zone on the Israeli border, formally occupied by a UN peacekeeping force. Now Syria is there with the backing of the Russians. We do not know if other Syrian surrogates such uh <coughs> sorry. <coughs> we do not know if any Iranians or Iranian surrogates such as Hezbollah are actively collaborating with the Syrians in this venture. But we certainly know that the Russians are and it's right on the border. It's visible from the Israeli side of the barbed wire. This week in prophecy, Mr. Erdogan has again pushed his rapprochement with Mr. Putin, a Russian-Turkish friendship that looks more like an alliance than a friendship, including the purchase of the S-400 weapon system. While at the same time, Turkey looks more like an enemy or an opponent of its NATO allies than an ally, even though Turkey, ironically, remains in NATO. The French have now joined the Americans to outmaneuver 
further Turkish military ambitions into northern Syria. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Egyptian government has scored a major victory against ISIS in the Sinai, again, very, very close to the Israeli border, not far away. As we read in scripture, Hine lo yanum valo yishan shomer Israel. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Please pray for the salvation of Israel and the Jews. Please pray for the salvation of Arabs. Pray that God will continue to discredit Islam and people will be saved out of it, as well as out of Talmudic Judaism. Please pray for the believers in the Middle East, both Jew and Arab. Please pray for Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Assisi in Egypt, and even pray for the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. He is blessing Israel this week in prophecy, recognizing Israel's right to exist. And not least of all, please continue to pray for Donald Trump, Mike Pence, and their administration. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Pash. God bless. Thank you.